Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us here on Mid-American Gardener. Whether you've been gardening for years or you're just a garden newbie that really wants to learn more, we're here to help you out. And we have an ever-changing cast of characters to help you, and today is no different. Uh, I, Candace, you don't mind if I call you a, a character, but anyway, so Candace, what do you have for us? <laughs> yeah, hello everyone. My name is Candace Hart. I'm a horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension here in central Illinois and I tend to focus on kind of annuals, perennials, cut flower production, home landscaping type of topics and I brought with me today to start off with two uh, two show and tell items. This week is National Pollinator Week so we have to talk about pollinators obviously. So I brought two milkweed species with me. If you follow along with uh, monarchs, um, you'll know that monarchs need the milkweed to complete their life cycle. So these are real, both really great landscape uh, milkweeds that you could put in. Uh, butterfly weed here. And this particular cultivar is called Blonde Bombshell that has really pretty yellow great name. flowers. I know, great name for it. <laughs> and then this is just kind of a common swamp milkweed. So whether you have dry soil, wet soil, there's a milkweed that you can plant in your, in your landscape. And I think that's a nice thing, that they're, they're, they're nice plants, they they're are. landscape plants, yeah. but then you're also helping out the pollinators, the monarchs, and actually a lot of, a lot of insects actually use the, the, the flowers for nectar. Exactly. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, these are yeah. both perennials. So those are both perennials, perennials yeah. so that's good. So thanks, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. So, so at pollinator week, hug a bee, exactly. or hug a monarch, Anything. or something <laughs> like that. Hug a, hug a pollinator. John, what do you have for us? Uh, I have an email. My, uh, first of all, my name is John Bodensteiner, mm -hmm. and I'm a Vermaine County Master Gardener. And I like hostas, perennials, basically plants. And <laughs> <laughs> anything. John loves and everything. I have a question from Pat, and she has um, a problem with some of her rhubarb. It's three years old, and it is not ripening this year. Uh, it keeps making also seed heads, and which she does pull off. Uh, the plants look lush and healthy. Uh, she mulched them well and uh, over the winter and fertilized with chicken manure from our, from their hands. Uh, and she wants to know why it won't ripen. Well, one of the things that I found out just doing some research on it, because I, I was trying to figure out why, but pH is one of the things that rhubarb is kind of sensitive to as far as ripening. It likes a pH of 6 to 6.8 for, for best. Now certain varieties will never turn red. I know we like the red just because of the, the looks. Pretty. And it's yeah. pretty. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but you know some of the green varieties are actually sweeter than the red. We'd think that, you know, once it ripens, it's going to be much sweeter. That's not the case. And um, <clears throat> like I said, she should for, you should fertilize rhubarb and asparagus are one of those heavy feeders. So you do want to fertilize that with a good composted manure. Chicken manure is probably one of the best. Uh, and then mulch it because one of the other things that it tends not to like is to be dry. So, um, and we'd, we've had some off and on, uh, moisture problems, uh, sometimes too much, not enough. And that could be why it's not ripening too, because uh, the, the ripening part is part of the moisture problem. Uh, another thing that they found is to not to change uh, the pH, you need to clean anything that starts to deteriorate. You want to clean that up, cut it off, get rid of it. And uh, especially in the fall when they, after they uh, freeze, cut everything off, get rid of it, take it away from the area because as it decomposes, it can change the pH of the soil. Okay, great. And one thing you don't want to do is eat the leaves, but there are some <laughs> things that you can do with them. And this is a compost, this is a, a cement leaf that I made out of one of the, the so smaller ones. So if all else ones. fails. So yeah. if all else turn saves, it into, turn it into artwork. a cement. Yeah. Okay, very good. Go. I, I did wonder about that too, if it, she, maybe she just really just had a variety that stays green. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of them are just don't even get, like they're almost like mm -hmm. a pinky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they don't really red, get red, that bright red. Yeah. So I really like that. So maybe just try it. I mean, just, it, it wouldn't hurt just to go ahead and eat some. Oh no, try it, it, right? it, it has, it's all edible. Yeah. It's, and I, and I actually, actually found that the green, lush. and I actually found the green is sweeter and better tasting than the okay. red. Okay, follow us fast, yeah. just try it. Okay, oh, very no. good, thank you, John. And Marty. Hello. My name is Marty Alanya. I'm a landscaper, and I have a landscape question. Coincidence? I don't think so. Susan writes, she had roses and honeysuckle, several 
uh, miniature roses, tea roses, and a climbing rose, and some Hall's honeysuckle, and all of them threw in the towel this winter. She wondered why. Um, well, uh, my opinion, and it seemed like the consensus here on the table too, was uh, the winter, this past winter, I don't have a client who didn't <laughs> have a rose that right. died back to the ground. Um, the weather stayed very warm. Even through Christmas, it was pretty nice. And then about the first week of January, the bottom just dropped mm -hmm. out immediately. And things just had not hardened up. They just hadn't gone dormant enough. <clears throat> so they had too much green growth on them. And they took the hit. So um, most, most of the roses that I have and my clients have, they typically came back. We lost some, but that's a perfect opportunity to try a new plant or to find, you know, go on the hunt for the one you loved and see if you can find another <laughs> one of it. Um, the honeysuckle, she, uh, Susan, you specifically say that this is Hall's honeysuckle. You need to know that Hall's honeysuckle is, um, well, it has a proclivity for world domination. So <laughs> we don't plant Hall's honeysuckle anymore, um, but there are some delightful other varieties. I personally like, um, uh, what did I just say? Gold flame. Gold flame. It's very Good nice, one. very nice. Bigger flowers, different, a little bit bigger flowers, not the little tiny ones you're used to, but they're like a big spidery, like a Cleome almost, and they're deliciously fragrant. Really nice. 10 to 12 feet. I don't know what else you'd want to cover okay. with that. So, okay. um, yeah, so, you know, if they come back, great. If they don't, new opportunities in the garden. So yeah. probably the big thing with roses is the fact that if they're on, you know, if they're grafted mm -hmm. and they die to the ground, mm -hmm. then you're gonna get that root stuff and it's gonna right. look very different. Yeah. But yes. if they're not grafted roses, True. then they come up from the base and it's fine. You're gonna have yeah. the same, you're gonna have to do some pruning. Pruning right. out the old, pruning yeah. out the old yeah. stuff. If, but yeah, if for example, you have knockout roses, yeah. knockouts grow on their own roots. Yeah. So anything that comes up out of the ground is gonna be what you want. The climber in particular and the miniatures also if the growth is wildly different yeah. <laughs> than what you were accustomed right. to, it's probably not your friend. So you just want to bite the bullet, dig them up, get a and new Usually one. you can okay. see get where that graft different. is. Oh yeah, you can yeah. see. If it's, it's above like a little the graft, you know, then they're fine if it's below the if graft. If it's yeah. below the graft by the rootstock, then yeah. you don't, dig it up. you typically yeah. don't want that. Right that so the, growth. So It'll just so we're clear, so the graft unit, it kind of looks like this gnarly, mm -hmm. kind of this bulbous, bulbous looking yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you can definitely tell there's a difference kind of oh, top yes. and bottom. Oh, so yes. it's kind of this bulbous, I don't mm -hmm. know how else to describe it, kind of this bulbous little growth looking it's thing like a, it's on like a the It's oversized stem. marble ball bearing about like yeah. that. Yeah, so and then, then you know it's probably maybe a grafted rose, and, mm -hmm. and if it's coming up from below that, then it's going to be a different rose on yeah. the top part. Okay. Yeah, okay. and so the rootstock typically does not bloom nicely. I mean, don't think, oh, I'll see what it is. Uh, you no. Kind of a wild. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Just not for that. Usually yeah. really thorny, okay. not good. that fun. So. Okay, get out the pruning shears, do a little no. pruning. Okay, very good. <laughs> and I just want to remind folks that uh, don't forget, if you're out gardening and you want to hear a little bit more about uh, what goes on in the garden, remember we do have our <laughs> podcast these days. And so this is a great opportunity for you to take your gardening outside. So you can go garden, you can listen to the podcast. And I know a lot of folks have done that are on the panel have done different podcasts. I did one as well and it's really a lot of fun. Victoria does a great job of asking all kinds of fun questions as well as we take care of a lot of the questions that you send to us through email or voicemail or whatever. So it's really a lot of fun. Check out the podcast. It's like, it's a, a, I love to be on the move like that and take stuff outside. So that's great. And we're going to go ahead and go to our callers. Now in line three we have Joe from Hoopston and it sounds like you have a question about your sweet gum tree. What can we do for you Joe? Well I've got a sweet gum tree that's probably about 30 feet tall and it's always been slow to leaf out. Hmm. But this spring, it leafed out like normal, but I'm having limbs where the leaves are suddenly just dying. Oh, wow. Different sides, different heights. I trimmed back the first couple when they died, um, but more keep dying. I don't know if I should keep trimming or keep my fingers crossed. Hmm. What do you think? So how old is this tree? Was it 30? 30 feet tall. Uh, 30, 30 feet, so. feet it's tall. probably seven or eight years. Seven or eight years old. Okay. Hmm. I would say maybe you want to take a sample of the wood and take it to uh, mm -hmm. the extension office and let them look or to the plant clinic. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. there could be, it's, it sounds like maybe, I'm not sure what the, um, sweet gums, if they're vulnerable to yeah. verticillium, being they're, 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 they're drying or dying in, in different areas. 
I, I think it, you need to have it diagnosed mm -hmm. and yeah. and then go from there because like it kind of like the roses and everything yeah we've had some terrible you know and and the weather too like it's been dry then almost too wet mm -hmm. depending on what it's where its feet are mm -hmm. uh, is it underwater is it is it a, in a good drainage area mm -hmm. uh, those yeah. are all factors yeah. that um, True. Yeah, can. and I would always do a, just a good inspection of like the base of the tree too to see if there's yeah, any like idea. girdling roots yeah. that are starting to get worse yeah. or mm -hmm. if it's planted too deeply because that's a common thing. Yeah, too. yeah to even look, or, look yeah. over the trunk, those kind mm -hmm. of things, yeah. just make sure that there mm -hmm. aren't even some damage on the trunk, those kind of things. Because yeah. sometimes it's hard to figure out with trees. Yeah. Because it, it's, you know, you have to look at the whole thing. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. But keep, you still keep also, your fingers crossed. You can also <laughs> call an arborist. And have, have an yeah, arborist you may decide okay. you want to go ahead with see a See if they can help you with it, you know. Might be able to answer a question okay, there. Hopefully so. that helps you out. And on line four, we have Les from uh, Danville, and you have a question about manure. As gardeners, we love manure. <laughs> what can we do for you? You ready? We are yeah. ready for you. You have a question about manure? <laughs> yes, uh, I've heard that uh, chicken manure might have salmonella in it, and if you put it on your tomatoes or anything that you're gonna not cook, uh, that the salmonella can get into the fruit and vegetables and make you sick. Well, that's actually an excellent question because we always want to be safe in the garden. Right. So what are some tips that people are concerned about? Mm. Either manure or One whatever they're putting in One thing you'd not want to do is put fresh manure yeah, on never it. Yeah, put yeah. Fresh. So you, never you fresh. You want to compost it, and I think that would take care of most of it. And not you're not leave. going to be spreading it. You should be putting it in the soil before you plant and, and that way, and then mulch over, and that way none of that is going to, if it rains, it's not gonna splash up on your mm -hmm. plants. And I think you're pretty safe once it's, it's, it's um, composted. Yep. That's compost. the thing, you yeah. need it composted. Never put fresh manure, whether it's chicken, cow, whatever. Yeah. Um, but chicken manure is very, very high. It's nitrogen, one of the highest yeah. as far as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's as good as getting 20, 20, 20 or... Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's good stuff, it just needs to be handled properly. Yes. Make sure it's composted. Yeah. Make sure you compost it. And, yeah. yep. and always wash, yep. wash your fruits and vegetables where you eat them, those mm -hmm. kind of things. Wash yep. your hands, those kind of things, just to make sure you have... So that's a really yeah. good question, Les. I'm yeah. glad you, you brought that up. Wanna, yeah. We want to be safe. We want to be safe. Once it's composted, you. and you know when it's ready to use because it's not hot anymore. I mean, it so it's cool like soil. And it doesn't smell anymore. It, well, it smells like smell. yeah, it soil, not yeah. the other S word. Okay, <laughs> all right. That's that's your nose nose. Really, that's the mm -hmm. that's yeah. the key. Good idea. So. Good idea. Okay, good tips. I'm glad you I'm glad you asked us that. Yes. Okay, and on line five we have Mary from also from Danville. We had a question about zucchini. I have a question about a zucchini. Instead of having lots of zucchini, I have a very healthy plant. It has beautiful blooms on it. I have plenty of bees around, and my flowers are just falling off. Mm -hmm. And I have no zucchini. So right now, that's not <laughs> uncommon because most of those flowers are male flowers. They're all probably on the main the main stem. W one thing I would probably do is cut the end off of the off of the main stem so you get the side shoots, force the side shoots. That's where your female flowers will start coming. And you can tell because the um, um, flowers will actually show the little fruit at the end it's so of cute. the flower. Like little they're, mm -hmm. they're like little, yeah. little baby zucchinis. Little and, teenies, yep. <laughs> yeah. They but are. I noticed my zucchini, it's doing the same thing. I have one that that is on a side shoot and sure enough, I got a, um, a baby zucchini on it. Yay. Or baby, it's a yellow squash, really. Okay. Okay. And, uh, we'll let it go um, this time. But, that's a, right. <laughs> but that is a good reminder of people that if the squashes, or even like cucumbers yeah. and all those kinds of things. So those first flowers generally are male flowers. <laughs> so it's not till later on then then you see the actual time. females. Because yeah. remember, the females are the only ones that are going to produce the fruit, the part we eat. Mm -hmm. So we always have to, a little botany lesson. There. The rooster may crow, but the, the hen delivers the goods. <laughs> <laughs> Marty always has these great <laughs> things. They're gonna write a book. She's gonna write. I'm just saying. So uh, excellent. So just take some time, Mary. Yeah. A little time, and you'll you'll get some zucchinis. So yeah. hopefully, it sounds like you're doing everything right. Great. Thanks. And on line three, we have a call from John from Farmer City, my hometown. Yay. Uh, and John, you have a question about hydrangeas. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Uh, my wife, Cindy 
uh, has planted little lime hydrangea and uh, is changing her mind, surprisingly enough, whether they should be. So <laughs> she'd like, uh, like to move it to a sunnier location. And how do you do that? And when would you do that? And any, any recommendations on uh, success? Okay. So how, okay. how long have they been in the ground? Uh, let's see, last year. Okay, all right. Um, choose a time when the weather is not too beatingly hot, but also <laughs> you can move them now. You can move yeah, them now. Um, I would cut them back probably at least half of their height. I would cut them back and then Get as much water them. Ball. Yeah, water them really well the night before. Um, get a good circle around them. You're probably going to come up with just about what was in the pot if they've only been in the yeah. ground a year. Yeah. Yeah. Have the hole they're going to go in ready because it's so hot and, in, and humid in the summer, it's hard for them to recover more quickly than when the weather is cool, but you can do it now. Um, so get the hole ready, water the plant the night before, dig it up, put it right in the hole, put the soil over and mulch it and water it. Water it like a trickle of water, like a pencil stream out of your, I hope take the nozzle off, put it right by the base of the plant, let it just trickle in until it puddles and let it go down. Puddle it again, let it go down. Um, and keep watering it about every other day for about 10 days. And it, you should start seeing a little bit of new growth. And that once, once you see some new growth coming on, then you can probably cut it back to once a week unless it water, unless it rains an okay. inch. So. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it should so do it's well. one of those things. So hydrangeas are really one of those. They really they like a lot oh, of water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. the they other do. thing, yeah. too. It's they just do. really make sure that one you One thing I like to do them. is, once, like you said, do, do dig the hole before. Mm -hmm. when you After you're done digging it, fill that hole with water. Yeah, and, if it's and, dry, absolutely. And, and mm -hmm. Absolutely. It'll That's a good drain, idea. and by the time you're you plant it, it's... The, you don't and if have it doesn't drain it. by the time you plant it, then that's not a good spot. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's true. no, yeah, that's yeah. not a good place <laughs> to put that. It'll leak. It'll, it will drown. Wet. Sometimes it'll leach out the, yeah. the, 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 the okay. moisture from the the plant if you don't pre-water the hole. Okay. True. Sounds good. True. And then ask your ask your wife twice where she wants <laughs> it put before you move it. But I'm just I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Sugar okay. lips. Where <laughs> now? On line four, we have Belva from Lincoln, and you have a question about geraniums. What's yeah. your question? Uh huh. Uh, I, I bought some the other day, and the lady told me that they were seeded geraniums and that they would, I could leave them out all summer and all winter, and they'll come up next year. Is that oh so? Oh, my. Mm -mm. What do you think, Not Candace? Quite. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. What she probably meant is that those geraniums were started from seed, because yeah. typically at the garden center you have seed geraniums, and then you have cutting, basically cutting uh, geraniums yeah. from cuttings. So she was probably referring to how they were started in the greenhouse. Um, so they typically do not reseed and come back the next year, unfortunately. Um, you could take cuttings from it or try to overwinter it inside for the winter if it's really something you want to save. But unfortunately, there are perennial hardy geraniums, but the, the typical annual geraniums with the big humble flowers, mm -mm. not going to come back, unfortunately. Mm, no, not in this no. climate. Yeah. yeah, I wish. <laughs> yeah, I wish. wish. At any rate, so good, good, good if question. If you have them in a so pot, now, you, you know. can bring them in. Yeah, but if, a lot of people no. overwinter them. Sure, if you, yeah. If you got the space and... So that could be one of the things you could mm -hmm. you could actually bring them in. They yeah. are one of those that you could actually. Bring yeah, you can just them dig them up in. and just throw them in a brown paper bag and take them to a dark, cool yeah. spot and replant them in the spring. I was okay. gonna say my grandmother used to pull them up, shake the dirt off, hang them upside down from the rafters in the basement, mm -hmm. and then she plant them again and they grow. Wow. That does not work for me. Cool, she had moist. an awesome yeah, basement definitely. and it was also had cool. A great basement. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. cool. It was basement. so cool. Okay, very good. Thanks. We dug it. Lots of good ideas. <laughs> And on line five, we have Shirley from Bloomington. And, oh, a tomato question. Yay, Shirley. What's your tomato question? Uh, yes. Uh, I have a big boy tomato, and it's growing like crazy <clears throat> and making all kinds of flowers, but then they turn yellow and fall off. Oh, flowers that aren't done. making it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've, we've had the excessive heat. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of times plants will kind of, take that as a hint that it's they're not going to survive and so I've got to abort the fruit because if I take this fruit and let it grow I'm probably going to die and so they abort a lot of the fruit when it's really dry or really really hot they like hot weather but not really hot mm -hmm. and so it's not uncommon just be patient 
as soon as it cools, you know, this week here is supposed yeah. to be just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, just about right for tomatoes. It's going to be warm, but yeah. not excessively yeah. hot and humid. And they should start to set fruit and uh, you should have no problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's usually it's those night temperatures. When yeah. we really have warm yeah. night yeah. temperatures. When you don't get that change. Yeah, and yeah. they don't get that, that often, mm -hmm. uh, they'll, the mm -hmm. flowers will fall off. And I've seen that actually done uh, uh, with uh, peppers. We'll do that too. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. peppers, peppers will do the same the, thing. The flowers will fall. Yep. Yep. So, unfortunately, you got to wait till the weather changes a little bit, but it yeah. should do that it's for us. So too hot, it won't. They won't set fruit. Okay, very good, thanks. And on line three, uh, Diane from Normal, you have mm -hmm. an, uh, we have another geranium question. Or yes. Uh -huh. uh, when I bought my geraniums, they were prolific with blooms. And I've cut them all, you know, taken the deadhead of them all back. And now they won't produce any new uh, flowering stems, the blooms. And they're, they're prolific with leaves, but not the blooms. How frustrating. Yeah. So yes, it's very frustrating. <laughs> have you, have I've you, never had have this you... happen because I usually have good luck with them. Have, have you, you fertilized? fertilized? <laughs> 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 have you fertilized those geraniums at all? Um, I used Miracle Grow, the one that has the fertilizer, and then I did just fertilize them about a week ago. Okay. More yeah. than likely, that's probably what the mm -hmm. issue is right now is that there's too much nitrogen available to those geraniums, so they're putting on a whole lot of foliage. Mm -hmm. um, so what I would do is I would stop the fertilizing, kind of cut back on that, mm -hmm. um, and even leach out that container a little bit, water really well. Uh, to kind of get some of that fertilizer out there. And then mm -hmm. once you do that, as long as there's enough sunlight on those, you should have plenty of flowers coming back. Because yeah. that's yeah. the one thing I wondered about too, is sun. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. full, pretty much yeah. a full sun. Yeah. yeah. They, they, like, like, they like a lot of sun. Also, if you are just dying to fertilize, get, <laughs> get a fertilizer where the middle number, yeah. the phosphorus, is the highest number in the three. It's nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. One's for the green, one's for the flowers, one's for the roots, in that order. So you want a high phosphorus uh, yeah. content in the in the fertilizer, yeah. bloom booster. Sometimes it's called something like that. Yeah. Okay. That'll that'll help. If you, but really, like Candace said, you could just lay off for just water and sun. You no. Know, yeah. And it's a fine. lot of times the potting soils already have fertilizer yeah. in exactly. them. And yeah. sometimes we forget the exactly. potting yeah. soil yeah. has fertilizer in it, and then we turn around fertilizer again. It's a, it well, and if you bought it somewhere, it's probably got asthma coat in the top. Mm -hmm. So, so maybe yeah, just, just you're loving them just to death. <laughs> A little scientific and neglect okay, there, Diane. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. Candace, do you have a, a I call sure for us or a email question? For us? I sure do. So I have a question here uh, about Nori Mabels. Um, this question is from Karen in Itasca, and she's um, asking that she has an 18-year-old Norway maple. It was originally planted next to a deck that they replaced with a patio two years ago. They did their best to protect the roots. The tree looked great last year. This year, they've had quite a bit of branch dieback. Some branches budded, they never leaped out, and then branches died. She's watering well. Could this be shock? Will it survive? Any help you can you can give? Um, it quite possibly probably is some root damage that occurred from uh, the construction of that uh, yeah. patio. A lot of that doesn't show up for the next couple of years after that that construction has happened. So anytime you're driving over the root zone of a tree or you're doing major disturbance to the root zone of a tree, uh, you're, you're bound and determined to probably kind of damage the root zone. So what I would say, um, Karen, is just to prune back those damaged branches and maybe even do an, a little bit of an additional pruning so the roots that are healthy don't have quite as much uh, tree to kind of stay up with uh, and really just kind of keep up with your watering. Apply some mulch um, to kind of help that soil moisture. But beyond that, you're just going to kind of have to wait and see. Yeah. yeah. Is it a con if it's a concrete patio, you just compounded the problem mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Because uh, everything underneath that patio stays bone dry. Um, yeah. If it's a and if it it's gravel the pH or too. yeah, it changes changes the pH a lot. The maple, you may lose it. If you do, another tree. Plant something there else. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Plant something else. Yep. And uh, John, want you quickly? We're gonna run out of okay. time here. If you want to go ahead and show us yes. your show and tell here, real well, quick. What I've got, I just brought a couple of things tonight that usually. It's, it's not real common to grow in the garden. The first one I brought is uh, ground cherries. They're, um, some people call them husk tomatoes. Uh, they're usually used uh, for desserts. I, I grew up with them. Also, brought mm. garlic scape. And these you can are, are available now in the garden. If you grew uh, garlic last fall, there, there's just abundant of this. And, and it's rather than let it go to waste, cut it off. 
The other thing, which cook is with them. the bad yeah. thing. Yes, you cook with them. Yeah, they're delicious. The bad thing is this. <laughs> this is Japanese beetles. They are here. Yeah, they don't have arrived. Don't cook, don't cook these. <laughs> Too crunchy. Yeah, unfortunate. Unfortunate. So oh, great. Some great tips. And I just want to let you, we always run out of time. It always seems I can remember if we didn't get to your call, you can always email us. You can certainly always, we also have a voicemail. And I just want to let you know that we're going to have some pretty exciting changes coming on Mid-American Gardener. So I really want you to all stay tuned. I think you'll find it's really going to be some great things happening here. So Are we going to be make naked? Sure. Uh, well, I don't know what Marty's got okay, his, uh, planned over here, but at any rate, so it's going to be a great time. So I hope you have a great week gardening. Thank you all very much. And remember, gardening is supposed to be fun. And if you're not having fun gardening, then you need to talk to us and we'll help you figure out how to have some fun gardening. And so remember, always check out our podcast, email us, voicemail us. There's lots of ways to connect with us. So we will see you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye.